All right, so this is copyright 2021. I'm Diana Wolf. I'm a library media specialist, digital learning coach at TC Terry Elementary. Um, I am Miss Diana Wolf on um, Twitter. There is the bit.ly to the presentation for today, and there is the slides carnival template as well. And if you can see over here, my love copyright, I do love copyright. Um, so you can see my little heart. Uh, it's really kind of funny why I love copyright. Hopefully you all have got the bit.ly by now. I'm gonna go into the next. So why is copyright important to me uh, and you? And it all kind of started for me whenever I was teaching junior high. And I really thought, man, these kids don't know anything about copyright and I need to know about copyright. I was, you know, a computer technology applications is what I focused on at the time. And so I really needed to, to make sure these kids understood it, but that mean I needed to understand it. And you don't really hear about it a lot. And every session I went to, I was just like, I don't understand. Um, so I just kept trying to figure it all out. And most of the stuff that I've gotten has is, is been through research, but I also just really rely on copyright.gov because you'll read a lot of things and then you get there and you're like, well, that's not what this says. So one other reason though, is that we are all copyright users and we are all copyright owners. And that is actually taken straight from copyright.gov. Um, which is part of the public domain, so you can use their images. Um, so anyway, but we are all copyright users, we are all copyright owners. So we're going to talk a little bit about that today. And for you all, there's lots of reasons for you to um, think that copyright is important. We are living in such a digital age. Um, it's really interesting in researching and looking for updates. Um, really, they haven't changed a lot about education um, and copyright since like 2002, but so much has changed. They've had to adapt and things have changed along the way, but not the actual law, really. Um, so I posted on Twitter. I don't think anybody had seen it. Maybe you hadn't come to my sessions, but I know the real reason that most people are here and wanted the update for 2021 is it's been a couple of years since I, I did this. And you're probably wondering about Ed Sheeran and where he's at. If you've been to any of my other sessions, you might know that um, that's kind of a big copyright issue and we are all super concerned um, about Ed Sheeran. Um, not really, but it's funny. Um, so anyway, we have, um, and I'm not gonna play these. And if you were in my normal session, we would take a listen to these. And it's really funny because you'll see everyone. And I love to see everyone's faces and I have you kind of hidden so I can see my screen today um, a little bit better. If my lights go on and off, you may not notice with the screen sharing, but it's weird in here, they might go off again. Um, so anyway, when I, when I do this, uh, I love seeing people's faces when we would listen to the first song and then we'd listen to the, the second song. And before I even hid like who, what all of the songs have in common. Um, but all of the so first songs are the first songs and then the, like that came out first. And then the second songs, um, are all Ed Sheeran songs, either written by him or performed by him. Um, and then there are articles to talk about it. And I left this in here, um, for you to be able to go to look at it. Uh, one thing with copyright is you might be interested in sharing this with others, and the, this is just one of how I started um, sharing with my students at the junior high. I would pick music, you know, and I usually started back with um, some other songs that, well, that I'll show you today, uh, and I'd go through a lot of those that were kind of bigger cases, and we discussed them, and the kids loved it. It was one of my favorite days of the year. Um, and I was kind of sad that I don't teach that anymore now that Ed Sheeran has all these copyright things. We'd really get into it. It'd be so much fun. Maybe I should ask if I can go back to the junior high for a day. I don't think my, my students in the elementary would appreciate it as much. Um, but all of these are the articles that kind of talk about what has happened since with these. Um, and just to give you an idea, in case you haven't seen it before, he settled a um, copyright infringement claim on um, his song Photograph. Um, and you can listen to both of the songs. Told you I'm not used to Zoom and all my, there we go. Okay. Um, and then uh, this song, I'm sure this is the Marvin Gaye one. Yes, for thinking out loud. Um, and, you know, we, we have like two right now for this one. So he's still currently in, in litigation over this one. And then this last one here is a Tim McGraw Faith Hill song. And all three of the, well, the first, this, this set and this set, I think are very similar. You couldn't argue a whole lot. So since summer 2019, um, August, I mean, a month later, 
um, here we were, Ed Sheeran's royalties were suspended. I didn't even know about this till recently when I was looking at it, I'd missed this update. I probably should add that to like my updates of things I get, all the Ed Sheeran copyright claims. And I should say, I love Ed Sheeran, I really do. Um, but it's just funny that all these things have happened to him or maybe not funny for him, uh, but he has a royalty claim on Shape of You. And, and if you scroll down, you can do this on your own, um, but here's the song and then here, or here's his song and then here's the other song. Um, and of course, this one came out first um, before his. And I don't think that they have a lot of similarities. Um, but again, this goes before a court. It doesn't, you know, come to me. They don't ask me who it's going to be or what, what's it going to be. So then in May 2021, here we go. We got another one. And this song, um, I didn't even realize that Ed Sheeran had written on it. It's um, a song called East Side. I teach Jazzercise as well. And that's a song that we do at Jazzercise. And, and I was like, oh, I know that song. So I listened to this other Loveless song. And the first like five notes are exactly the same. Um, and again, you can scroll down and you can listen to those too. Um, I'll let you kind of do that one on your own. But I just thought, oh my gosh, that, and then I don't think the rest of the song sounds like it. And I'm not sure. Can you sue over a couple notes? Um, I mean, they, are currently right now um, going through that. But, you know, it's just stuff like that, that we as, as educators, you know, it's interesting. That's kind of, you know, how I got hooked on. It's very interesting, but well, we don't know what our kids are going to do and we need to teach them to be responsible. Um, so here, you know, Ed Sheeran, again, I love Ed Sheeran, but here we are. <laughs> um, so copy, let's talk about a little bit about that. Um, it is the exclusive legal right to reproduce, publish, sell, or distribute the matter and form of something as a literary, musical, or artistic work. Um, and all of my links will link to something. This one is the copyright.gov site. They kind of updated it. It looks a little bit nicer. Um, and you can go through and read it. This is a little bit, um, the terminology is a little bit easier to read. Here's the we are all copyright users and owners. Um, and it gives you just a little bit of more information. And again, this is one of those things that, like I said, I really got into it and wanted to know because there was so much out there, but I didn't know what was real and not real and, and how much of it was true. And you might be surprised that some of the things that I share today, you might say, I always thought that, that was, you know, this was what it was supposed to be. Um, so um, lots of intellectual property and, and they haven't changed a whole lot. Um, with the education part, but they have, they do continue to update and change a lot with just copyright in general. And as the educators, you know, we have to share that with our students as well with, when they create things. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the copyright symbol. Um, a lot of times people think I can just add that copyright symbol on it and that means it's copyrighted. Well, no, or there's not a copyright symbol on it. So I can use it. There's no copyright. Also, no, um, in general, registration is voluntary. Copyright protection exists from the moment the work is created. However, registration provides important benefits such as proof of ownership. So even if it doesn't have the copyright symbol, whoever created it holds the copyright. If you find something, you know, you create something and you add the copyright symbol on it. Um, I mean, you already have the copyright. That symbol might mean something, but it, the symbol is just if it is um, legally registered. However, it doesn't have to be legally registered. So those are some things just to kind of keep in mind about copyright. Um, so here are some examples of copyright. Um, there are lots and lots and lots of copyright. Um, literary works, musical works, um, including any accompany words. That's kind of the thing right now with Ed Sheeran um, with this song, Thinking Out Loud. He has Marvin Gaye's family suing, and I think they use the sheet music. Well, someone else's family who helped write the music, they are trying to sue for the same song, um, but they're trying to sue with the performance version of it. And so they're going back and forth with that right now. Um, dramatic works and the music, Hannah Mom's choreograph works. Um, I mentioned earlier about teaching jazzercise. That's something that someone creates the dance to it. I do not create that dance. And if I were ever to quit and stop paying my dues to be able to teach those classes, then I would not be allowed to use that choreography anymore. Um, so all kinds of um, pictures and sculptures and art, movies, audio, visual, like things that you can see too, sound recordings, um, and that includes just spoken words too. 
and then architectural works, which I don't think I really realized that till recently, which makes complete sense. Um, you have to buy plans to make houses and things like that. And you don't just say, all right, here's this house. You know, there's lots of things that go into that. So having that copyright is very important for people's jobs. Um, so these categories should be viewed broadly for the purpose of registering your work. For example, computer programs and certain compilations can be reg registered as literary works. So that's another thing um, that's changing in the copyright world, but not you don't have to change the law necessarily, um, even though there's a lot more things like the computer programming it can be put in as something else. Um, maps and technical drawings can be registered at, as pictorial, graphic, and sculptural works. And this is on um, copyright.gov, this copyright basics. Um, and this is kind of a cool little PDF that goes through and tells you just a little bit more um, about copyright. And again, the language on this is a little bit nicer too to read when you try to go through the law. Um, and then this also talks about what is not protected. Um, you know, ideas, procedures, methods. Um, so this is works that are not fixing it. And that's the thing about the tangible form. You have to be able to prove it. So that's why getting that copyright sometimes is a better idea so that you can go back and prove it and have that um, down. So lots of information in here if you want to dig in just a little bit more. Uh, which is another reason why I try to provide all these links um, because you might be like me and become a copyright nerd and just want to know more. Um, public domain is the state of belonging or being available to the public as a whole and therefore not subject to copyright. So you're not legally required to cite it, but most people do cite that. But when it's in the public domain, it's completely fine. And .gov sites are public domain. Um, so in all of this too um, is... United States law. So keep that in mind too. If you're looking at something outside of the United States, it, it's a little bit different when you go to other countries. Now, fair use, that's where we get into education a lot. So we're going to spend um, some time on fair use today. Fair use is a legal doctrine that promotes freedom of, of expression by permitting the unlicensed use of copyright protected works in certain circumstances. And this will take you to the um, copyright.gov fair use site. Um, as you scroll down, it talks about fair use and how, um, how you can use it. And right here, it says such as criticism, comment, news reporting, teaching, scholarship, and research. So those are examples. Um, and you can go through, there's a fair use index where you can actually search through. And that is kind of what helps us to figure some things out about fair use, but as you'll learn that fair use is not very simple. So four factors to consider for fair use. One is the purpose and character of the use, including whether the use is of commercial nature or is for nonprofit educational purposes. Now, it doesn't mean that just because you're a nonprofit that you can just use anything you want. And it doesn't mean that just because you're commercial that you can't use anything. There's a lot of things that go into it. Um, the nature of the copyrighted work, what are you doing with that work? Um, the amount and substanti substantiality of the portion used in relation to the copyrighted work as a whole. That one is the one that'll get a lot of people and we're we'll talk about that more. Um, and for the effect of the use upon the potential market for the value of the copy copyrighted work. So right here, these arrows will take you to a link um, that takes you back to the link we were at. This is fair use myths, uh, not really the myths on YouTube, but fair use on YouTube, because um, there's a lot of things that are changing. YouTube is one of the things that does change a lot. And then there are also some cases if you wanted to use for class discussion, but let's talk a little bit more about fair use. So this is um, from copyright.gov. Although the fair use index should prove helpful in understanding what courts have to date considered to be fair or not fair, it's not a substitute for legal advice. And I actually read recently that um, the copyright offices cannot give you legal advice. They can only tell you what the law is, but it doesn't go back to them. It, fair use is a judge created doctrine dating back to the 19th century and co codified in the 1976 Copyright Act. Both the fact patterns and legal application have evolved over time and you should seek legal assistance as necessary and appropriate. Um, I've Earlier, when I was going through this again, down here, 
In addition to the above, other factors may also be considered by a court in weighing a fair use question, depending on the circumstances. Courts evaluate fair use claims on a case-by-case -case basis, and the outcome of any given case depends on a fact-specific inquiry. This means that there is no formula to ensure that a predetermined percentage or amount of a work or specified number of words, lines, pages, copies may be used without permission. That one is the one that gets people a lot. You've all seen the formula. This many pages or this percent of this or this or this or this. It's not true. It is just not true. And I would never tell anyone to do that. People will ask me questions a lot and I will take it from my point of view. I have to be able to argue it in a court. Now, if I can't argue fair use, I won't do it. Um, if I don't feel like I can stand behind it and this predetermined percentage or amount, you can't stand behind that. You have to stand behind all of it. Um, all of those four things um, right here, all of this is the important part, not, not just three. So those are things that we really have to take into consideration. Um, so, so uh, some updates, fair use and distance learning. So this was from March, 2020. And again, this is um, copyright.gov. This is teaching from a distance and copyright considerations, March 17th. Um, and it's not, it's not by Holland Gormley. If you scroll down, you can see um, it's a guest post by attorney advisor in the office of the general counsel. So this goes through and talks to you about face-to-face -face activities, what you can do, what you can't do. And it talks about the TEACH Act. Again, 2002 is when that was updated. Um, and there is actually a quote on the next page rather than going through all that to the quote. Uh, as most teachers probably know, copyright law covers many of the things teachers use to educate students from textbooks to music to artwork, plays and movies. That doesn't mean you always need permission to use these works. There are limits. Fair use is a big one, but fair use while flexible is not always easy to determine in advance. Um, so that one is one that went, you know, and I, I read this, you know, from March of last year and knowing kind of what we've all gone through, we've all done the best we can. I mean, that's just kind of where we, maybe sometimes we haven't, maybe sometimes we've just let things slide that we wouldn't normally. Um, and I think they have been a little more lax, but I think that as things get back to um, a normal school, that, that they will start cracking down on a lot of those things. And this was just kind of an interesting read that talks about, you know, what you could do. And it talks a lot about performances as well. Um, so there's a lot on here if you would like to go through and read that um, too give you a little bit of an update. Um, this one for all of you, I know I saw some library media specialists out there, um, the COVID um, publisher information. So this right here was just created um, to kind of keep everybody updated and has the table of contents so you can go through. A lot of these have expired. Not all, but a lot of them have. Some of them even have June 2020. So I'm not sure if they didn't update this site. Um, but I went to every person's website. We did a, um, a COVID read aloud, or not COVID, but we did read aloud. Everybody was out, you know, in, in November, the end of November into December, and we wanted to do something to kind of pull everybody together. So I did um, every, every day, I think we did 12 days of Christmas, um, and we just read 12 books up until we got out of school, like the last two weeks. And we did, you know, we did a, we did a 12 days of Christmas song, but we did a book read or, you know, something like that. And every single book, you know, someone would say, well, I want to do this one. Okay. Let me check the publisher. Um, and we posted them and every, you know, most of the publishers were, you know, like take them down after, and there was a certain date at the time. And I think I left mine up. I, I took all of mine down before the date that we were asked to, because I just left them up through January and took them all down in January because I didn't want to forget, but I knew that we could do it. And, and our district has been really good about being like, uh, can you do that? Are you sure you can do that? So here I get to pick up my phone, get a text from our, um, one of our head people. And she's like, um, I don't think you can do that. I'm like, I can, I promise. I checked it out. I have all the permissions. We're good to go. Um, she said, okay, well, I feel comfortable if you do this. And I said, okay, I don't have to do that, but I, you know, I totally understand. I will make sure that we do that. So we, you know, we did what the publishers asked and we also did what she asked. Now there were a couple of books that the publishers <laughs> would not let us put them on um, like YouTube or things like that. So 
we actually had to lock them down, you know, so I would put them on Google Drive and then have the note that said, only students can access this or someone with a Bowling Green District ID. And that is what the publisher asked for. I know a lot of people were doing this um, and they were, we talked about it at Summer Refresher and they said that they did this to put them on their Google Drive or something else similar um, that that was locked down to only the students could see. And whether or not that's legal copyright or not, it all kind of depends on what the publisher allows. Um, now, again, when you look at that Teach Act and you look at the fair use, if you're in distance learning and you can't provide that in another way, that makes, you know, you, you could argue fair use, but again, fair use is one of those that you have to argue. Um, and no one's gonna tell you if you're you know, right or wrong on that um, before you go to court, because no one knows it. So, but that, and like I said, I don't even think that this is the most accurate um, one. That was one they were keeping up with, but I would go to, I would go to every publisher before I would do one of those. Um, virtual movie options. This one, you know, I know our school at this point, we are planning on being all in person, um, but I, you know, that might not be an option. There might be some still doing some other things, but even when we weren't, I talked to our movie licensing, um, which is through, it's movie licensing USA, but Swank is the um, site for this one. And I got a response and I'm going to skip ahead of this one. She said, rebroadcasting a film over Zoom, Google Classroom, or Microsoft Teams is not legal and is prohibited by the studios. Due to COVID, we have been able to obtain alternative viewing options for our licensed schools from some of the studios when we provide the content for virtual movie event. And that is from Angelia Dixon Bunch. She's the copywriting licensing manager. Now, when you click on this to take you through Swank, and everyone could have gone differently, um, this will actually have where you can um, engage your audience and they do it on their end a little differently, but there is a price for that. Um, I think in one of the emails I got, it was um, like $100 per movie. Yeah, right here, a technical fee of $100. And I don't know, that says active annual license to show approved title. So maybe it's only $100, um, not per event, but if you wanted to do that. So there were lots of, you know, things and they, they host it. We had this before. Um, I did Swank in 2019 to 2020 and we streamed and because we're, you know, we don't have DVDs anymore and we wanted that option in the classroom. Um, but I just don't think we used it enough and I wasn't sure how we'd use it, especially last year. Um, so we didn't get it last year, but they have a way for like the kids can even log in to watch some of their movies. Um, and they have the licensing for that and that's okay. Um, but it is, you know, it's a substantial fee depending on how many kids you have in your school and things like that. <laughs> but those are your legal options. Um, outdoor movie had was added um, as well. That is usually you have to pay for any outdoor movies. If you have that movie licensing in your school, um, then you can show any of the movies inside, but outside was an issue. But because again of COVID-19, they are allowing some outdoor events for schools. You can browse some of the films um, and you there are some ideas that they have with some of the films and there's a request form um, to talk about it. And I do not believe there's, you know, maximums and, and different things that you can discuss on this. But we talked about doing this because you can with your movie license, you can sell tickets up to the amount of your movie license, and then you can't sell any more tickets, but you can sell refreshments all you want. And we had talked about even doing an event where we had food trucks come out, and then a lot of the food trucks will give back some of that amount of money to your school for fundraisers and things like that. Um, so this one was one, you know, because outside um, that has kind of changed a little bit for now, but I don't know how long all of these changes will last. Um, this is kind of a new thing on copyright.gov, engage your creativity. Um, this talks about, and this might be something good, especially if you have some older students. And this is that copyright basics that I was looking at earlier um, that talks all about copyright. Um, and then it also talks about copyright for different things. So if you have, you know, especially high school and even middle school, 
you have these specific teachers in these areas, this is something that you could share with them that they could share with their students um, to teach a little bit more. And then there are videos from copyright.gov. They've really um, changed a lot to make it a little more user friendly, I think. Um, and I, you know, I do appreciate that because again, we are living in a time where we want to teach our kids, you know, that they're the future. We want everyone to be doing things in the legal way. We don't want anyone to not have had that um, education on them, the topics. So uh, this might be something to share with your staff, or maybe you could use it. Um, Netflix also has instituted documentaries on YouTube. Here are their lists, and they even talk about that they have allowed teachers to screen documentaries in their classrooms. Here's a link here to, to some of those, but they know it wasn't very easy to do. And then kids could also, you know, didn't always have the option to do it. So they put some online for people to do on YouTube, you know, because more people have access to YouTube. So there are several on here um, that they have allowed for you to do. And then there's still their in-person screening. If you go to it, you can see some of the information on that as well. Um, let's see. All right, we, so we went over this um, quote and this quote. So we're gonna talk uh, now about Creative Commons um, and it's a nonprofit organization that enables the sharing and use of creativity and knowledge through free legal tools. But it is a, I mean, here's the site, but the Creative Commons is, you know, it's a nonprofit company. Um, you can search for Creative Commons images. You can also share your own. Um, you can specify what you want. This is um, also, you know, you can use these commercially, which is really kind of cool. Um, so you can search for all of your content here. They did have um, another way to search before the old searching portal, and you can narrow it down a little bit differently, um, but this will allow you to do that. Now, you can, when you go to Google search, um images that's one of the things that you can kind of narrow it down with almost always just search dog and then more no tools okay and then usage rights and this is where you have your creative commons licenses now these are not always going to be a hundred percent so you do have to be careful um, but this is a way to do that as well. If you don't want to get the Creative Commons site, you can do that through Google. I also am a big fan of Commons Wikimedia. And partly, um, for some reason, and maybe it's a state thing, I don't know if it's state or a Bowling Green thing, but Pixabay is always um, blocked for me. So I, a lot of times, will just go to uh, Wikimedia Commons and I can search through there too. Okay. All right, so um, we're gonna have, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, this first. So which one possibly violates copyright? Now, I probably have already given you a big hint on this one. So let's talk about all of them first. Uh, the first one is California Farms by the Peterson Brothers. And they are a really fun group of guys. And this is a um, parody video. And you might recognize the music. A little parody of uh, California Love from Tupac. California, no California. So um, the next one's Uptown Funk. And you've probably heard that one too. And then we have Queen Under Pressure. It's a really weird video. And does everybody else play the game when you hear one of the songs, you have to decide which one you like better or which one it is not, not better. All right, and then here's Thinking Out Loud. Oh, apparently I just went to the next screen, went back, sorry. All right, so let's take in the next screen. Uh, fair use covers parodies, so they're good. Um, they have lots of parodies. You should definitely check them out if you're interested um, in parodies. The kids always thought they were really fun because they'll take you know popular songs and do those. Um, Uptown Funk did get in trouble, um, or the writers did, but they 
um, went on and added the writers. The other song was called Oops Upside Your Head. And maybe some of you know that. We had this Grammarly first. All right, so Oops Upside Your Head. I would do this one and make the kids all sing Uptown Funk to it, and they they could. Though, though you saw it, some said that is not that is they don't sound alike at all. Okay, they do. Uh, and again, they added the writers to that. So this is not a possibility of violating copyright anymore. It did when it, it came out, but now it's different. Um, the original song uh, is under pressure, so there was no um, issue with that. But Vanilla Ice did um, get did allow them to get royalties for Ice Ice Baby. And there's a whole interview right here with Vanilla Ice. It's an old MTV interview that I absolutely love. Um, and again, these are things that I did with the kids a lot. Um, and even though they're not, you know, old enough to know these songs, a lot of their parents did, and, and they just know them. They're in pop culture at this point. And then again, this one is thinking out loud. And currently, it is possibly a violate uh, a copyright violation. Um, the judge just has not dismissed the Mar Marvin Gaye, and now there is the other one as well. Um, and it is a little different. I wonder where it's that one's at. It talks about it through here as well, though. The other, another author um, <laughs> um, wants to um, file it as well. So, you know, I, like I said, I love Ed Sheeran, um, and he just, I don't know if it's because he's just so popular that he gets in trouble or what's going on, but um, it's been a lot of fun to just kind of talk about it um, with all the copyright stuff. Um, so that's kind of introduction. So let's talk about the Kentucky Academic Standards for Technology. Um, what I just showed you is something that I would do with our students. And, you know, teaching copyright is something that is embedded in our standards. Um, these, there are specific standards specifically with um, creative communicator and digital citizen, but you know, copyright really can fall into all of these categories. Um, some of the specific vocabulary in the standards is just the word copyright. You have intellectual property that's used a lot, fair use, public domain, creative commons. Um, right here, you can get to the standards. Um, and then this is the Kentucky Digital Learning Coaches Tech Standards site. You might want access to it. And then you can look at, they've, they've done a lot of awesome things here. And right here, you can take to them to a dashboard of the resources and examples as well. Now, you're not going to find, you know, the copyright necessarily on there from that. But again, when you, whenever you're teaching things, you can continue using that vocabulary <laughs> to let them know, hey, this is, you know, important for you to be a good digital citizen. Um, you're creating these things, but you need to make sure that you're following copyright laws, you know, and you need to be setting an example in your own classroom by following um, all of the rules as well. Um, so now we're going to do a couple, which of these is a violation of copyright in education? Um, the first one, anything I use for class is fine. It's education. So I can show movies purchased by the school to use for rewards, post materials online to share with my students on my website, giving credit to the source. Okay, I can show a movie that I bought, not, not the school, in class if it relates to what I'm teaching, even though my school does not have a movie license. My school could get in trouble for breaking copyright, even if we cite the source or the material does not have a copyright symbol. I guess that's maybe it's a, which one's the truth and which ones or which one is not the truth. And some things I can show in my class, I may not be able to use online because the setting of my classroom is different online versus virtual and blended learning online. So um, does anyone have a guess on which one you, um, oh, I went to the next one. I clicked on the chat for a second and I went to the next one and now well, let me go back. There we go. All right, so the one, the first one, obviously, you can't just do anything you want. Even if the school purchases it um, for rewards, you still have to have a movie license. Um, giving credit to the source doesn't mean that you can just share it. Um, showing a movie that you bought, even if you don't have a movie license, if you're showing the part of the movie and it relates to your content and you're teaching it, then um, it is fair use. 
Um, but don't stream from a personal streaming service. You know, don't stream from Netflix. Most of the time it's blocked, but you know, a lot of people want to stream from Amazon Prime Video. If you didn't buy the video, then it's not yours. You don't have the license to do that. There's a lot of end user end user agreements that violate that. Who lose the same way? Um, so you have to be really careful. Disney Plus. I've seen a lot of teachers doing that, not necessarily in Kentucky, um, but other places discussing doing that too. Um, my school could get in trouble for breaking copyright. Even yeah, you're, there are consequences for breaking copyright. You know when you do get caught, if you get caught, um, and they do. We we've had that. Um, so which is a violation of using music on YouTube. I can download free music from YouTube using my projects online, and feel free to chime in here too. Um, I can use some popular songs on YouTube, depending on. Um, the license which with YouTube and that specific song, as long as I buy the song legally, I can use any song I want on YouTube as long as I credit the artist. Um, that's, you know, how people will say that I do not own the rights to this music. Um, they'll put that little disclaimer and then I can create a parody of a song and post it on YouTube. So um, feel free to unmute and tell me which one you think is the not true. So this is like three truths and a lie. So one of these is a big old lie. <laughs> parody is true. That's right. Uh, thank you, Martha West for that one. Yeah, parody is definitely true. This one's true. And this one can get a little tricky too. So, um, I can download free music from YouTube, use my projects online. There are songs you can download. Right here's the link to these. Um, they've changed the links a lot, um, but there are free songs right here, free music, and you can come over and you can literally, when you click on it, there will be, there's your download right there. So you can use, um, there are some you can use in there that are straight from YouTube. Um, I can use some popular songs depending on the license. Yes. And they used to have it where you could look up the policy in the license, but you can't now. So the policy has changed. It is still true. Um, and it could be a content ID, but you, we, there's no way it, that I have found that you can look that up. So if you decide to use a popular song, then they can request that it gets taken down. And then if you get three copyright strikes in 90 days, then you'll be terminated. Um, but content ID would allow if there's a claim made, then the person who's um, who did that song could actually get money off of your video and you wouldn't get a strike. But it all depends on what song it is and whose it is. And now YouTube doesn't have it where you can look that up. So it's going to be a lot harder to do that. Um, you cannot just buy the song legally and then use it on YouTube by crediting the artist. Um, Maybe you can, because again, if it's one of these songs, maybe, but not just any of the songs. Um, and you can't check beforehand anymore, which makes it really difficult. Um, and then parodies, again, there's, um, it's covered under fair use. And um, right here, we have some fair use. And there's an audio library, again, that tells you how to, you can reuse the content. Um, but fair use is fine for you to do. So parodies are again fine. Um, and I say they are because they are, but that's also back to the fair use index and back to when I told you that fair use is also argued by judge. So it could be, you know, a thing. I mean, I, I think that the, it shows that that would be fun for people to do based on um, all of the past, but Again, it's something that would be argued with fair use. We had an issue, and this is, you know, from six years ago. So it's been a little while. And we had, uh, our teacher was actually out the day that this happened, um, that was in charge of the news. And so she didn't necessarily know what happened, but there was a Taylor Swift song. And we know Taylor Swift is really particular about her copyright. And not that she shouldn't be, but she, you know, very particular. So they had a, uh, they used an app to create a video. It was a fun Friday video and the song was in the app. So they downloaded the video that they made and they put it in their news broadcast, but it wasn't covered under fair use 
in education. It wasn't covered under fair use in um, news reporting because it wasn't <coughs> reporting it. It was just for fun. And this bad blood remix right here, it was the whole the whole thing was muted. They you know wanted you to remove the song if you wanted the audio restored. Um, so it just couldn't be done that way. You know, it was just something that had to be done very, very carefully. Um, so you're you know you can get in trouble. Um, it's muted in all countries. This specific song was, and I have another one on mine where some students had created it, and they were using song that was kind of like background music. And we had a content ID claim on ours, but they did not mute it, but they had the rights to put a mod, you know, like they could make money off of our video by adding an ad to it. Um, so that those are some things that, you know, we just have to understand and teach our students about too. A lot of people will just take that and slap on, I do not own the rights to this song, da, 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 da. That doesn't matter. If you do or not, um, it still can be an issue. Um, so which is not fair use. Uh, my students used music with a copyright in a newscast about the song it used. Uh, my school has a movie license and I streamed a movie from Amazon Prime that related to what I was teaching. I used images and only showed them in my classroom. We created a parody and shared that online. Well, the student used music with copyright in a newscast about the song it used. So this falls under news reporting and can be argued fair use. You have a movie license, you stream a movie from Amazon Prime that's related to what you're teaching. It would be really hard to argue fair use based on Prime's end user agreement. You could try, but it would be something that I would not personally do. Um, I would, I just, I wouldn't do that. Um, I only used, or I used images and only showed them in my classroom. This falls under the educational setting since it's only in the classroom and can be argued fair use. Again, all of these are argued fair use. It's not cut and dry, but I would feel comfortable doing these things and, and most of us do those without a second thought. We create a parody and shared that online. This falls under parodies. It can be argued fair use. It's funny because, um, you know, at the beginning, uh, Amy was was kind to call me amazing. Uh, I don't know if I'm amazing, but I get a lot of copyright questions. People that I know will just send me a message. What do you think about this? I'm like, I I would do it, you know, personally. Uh, I'm not the end all know all to copyright, but I, you know, I spent a lot of time just researching and, and to get some ideas for it and to kind of figure it out again for my own. I just wanted to know what it was and wanted to understand it. Um, and I get the parody one a lot. Do, do you think that this is okay? I just, I mean, what about the music? Well, we can see everybody else is doing it. And not that that means that we should do it too, but you know, you have people who are doing it, using the music and it has not been an issue. Now you have to be careful if you use, you know, music that you found like a karaoke version of the music, because then that might be an issue because that karaoke has probably its own copyright to it. So that kind of is where you go back and forth with, well, what about the music? Well, you might need to find someone who can play the music for you to make it you know, if you feel, if you're really like, oh, I don't know if I should do it, things like that. Um, but parodies are fun. Some recent copyright questions I had. This first one um, we talked about at Summer Refresher, Bitmoji Classrooms. I love a Bitmoji Classroom. I have tons of Bitmoji Classrooms or, uh, you know, I'll have like a Bitmoji Classroom and I'll link to more books. And someone said, well, what, what about the links? And that's the second part, link to books being read on YouTube. Well, first, Bitmoji Classrooms, just the Bitmoji Classrooms in general. Um, someone was telling me last summer that they couldn't put them on Teachers Pay Teachers. They could not be copyrighted. Um, I guess if you were doing the art on it and you were the one doing all the things, maybe it could. But when you make those, a lot of times you're making them in Google um, Slides and you're using um, the art that you found on Google. Yes, you put the time and effort into it, but you're using the other free things and it would be hard. Now, I don't think it would be bad if you wanted to put your, um, you know, created by you at the bottom. I was in a session and she might be here again today, but um, on Tuesday when I was teaching about um, applications in the classroom, I had taken someone's Bitmoji classroom for Kentucky Bluegrass Awards and, and added my own stuff to it. And I said, someone in here might have created it. And she raised her hand. She's like, yeah, I did. And I was like, I appreciate it. You know, these are things that we share. And if her name had been on it, I would have left, you know, like left her the credit for it. Um, I do appreciate those, but those are being created and shared so much that it would be hard to have a copyright on that specific classroom. Um, but the links to the books being read on YouTube, I'm not reading the books. 
Um, I find other people on YouTube reading the books. I do not know if they have permission or not. Um, I always assume if you read a book and you put it on YouTube, you have permission. And if it's on YouTube and it's public, then I can share that with my students. Um, now, I don't see any way, and that's something that I've read in the past with distance learning as well. In distance learning, you can get away with sharing things with your students. You know, you don't teach it out loud, but if there's a link to it somewhere else. You can say, all right, here's the link to this. You can go look at it instead of actually showing it while you're in class. So that's kind of one of those things linked to the books being read on YouTube. I, I don't think that there's a problem with that because I'm, I didn't create it. I didn't put it on YouTube. So that's not a copyright issue for me. And then letting them read that, um, listen to that book on YouTube. It's a public book, you know, it's just an audio book. Um, and we use other things too. We have the Mac and Via um, books that they can read and listen to. And we use um, Epic. And KYVL has some that we do as well, but this just gives them a couple more options to do. Um, but I mean, when it's on YouTube and it's public, I, I just feel like that's probably going to be okay. Um, sharing through Google Drive or similar. Um, people ask about that a lot too. And again, I had the publisher's permission to share when I did through Google Drive. Um, if you don't have their permission, that's where it kind of, you know, you'd have to argue fair use on that because it still is online. Now, if it's distance learning and you could, you know, say, well, we were doing this and this is, or even not, not just distance learning, but if a student missed class and you wanted that on there for them to be able to take a look at it at a different time, I think that would work because it would be, but you would only want it for those students. So those are kind of, again, fair use and what you would argue. Um, media at school, again, here is a link to copyright movies, why you should you know, have the license and then the streaming services. This talks about the Netflix documentaries as well as the end user agreements. Um, so think about those things too. Um, let me see. Okay, here's a lot of online free resources for you. Uh, I have changed a lot of, or not changed, but I've, I've gone through and, and tweaked some of these things as well um, for you to take a look at. But here are lots of images, um, videos, audio, mixed media. So this is various things you can go to look at. Again, that Creative Commons. And this might take you, it might be the, the search now. Let's see, yeah. Um, and then on this, I think I have one more page. Okay, so right here are more resources. This will open up, and I love HyperDoc. Um, I mean, I, I was doing HyperDocs before that was a term, I think. Uh, or maybe it was a term, I just didn't know it yet. Um, but I, I love doing this. I love having those on here. Um, and I try to go through and update these and change these. There are lots of them on here. Um, some of these are, might be, a, there might be a couple of old links I tried to keep um, updating them most of the time pretty well. Um, but there's a lot of things on here. And I'll continue to upload or do that as well. Oh, I forgot to talk about the YouTube Creator Academy. I'm going to talk about this and then I'm going to see if you'll have questions because um, I know we only have about 10 minutes. This YouTube or this Creator Academy is really cool, especially again for those of you who have students who are really interested or maybe you're interested. Um, but it goes through and talks about how to do and how to create things. And there's courses on, um, you know, getting started, all of all the things for YouTube. And it's so popular right now. I just feel like this would be great. I, I have um, my boyfriend's son is 14 and he was complaining about something with YouTube because he'd put something up on there and, and they, I don't know, something shut him down and we had to try to explain that he kept saying that someone did it to him. Like, no, it was probably YouTube um, that did it. And you probably did something that you weren't supposed to do and you just didn't know it. Um, and I think this will be a great thing for all of those um, students who are who are doing a lot of you things on YouTube to understand and to go through to really um, go through some of the courses and explore it a little bit more. So I wanted to include that link in there for you all as well today. And then I'm going to put those links back up um, so that you can see it. But do we have any questions that um, you all would like? I'm trying to go through the chat, but I know I missed a lot of stuff in the chat, and I've seen mostly All right, 
So do we have any questions? Feel free, unmute and talk to me. Do you see another one pop up in the chat? Let's see if it's a question. I know that there is a PD um, certificate survey um, in the chat ready as well. Um, I personally don't see a problem. Um, if it's on YouTube, I think you can share, you can show that. Um, it's a little bit different than a movie license um, the, that you are using because the movie license is um, with a company. You know, they've published these things where on YouTube, it's out there um, and it doesn't have a publisher in the same way. And if it does, they're getting paid for it being on YouTube through monetizing and things like that. So I, I think anything that you watch on YouTube is fine. Um, I also, sometimes if it's a free site that has things on it, um, I sometimes will use those as well. If it's free, if I'm paying for it, I feel like it's a little different, but if it's free, I'm like, well, anyone could use this and we could be able to do that. Well, you are very welcome. I appreciate you all coming. Uh, hopefully you learned something again. Feel free. Uh, I didn't put my email on there, um, but you can, it's diana.wolf at bgreen.kyschools.us and feel free to contact me. I'll put it on um, my other, I'll put it on one of these later if, if you want to go back to any of my bitlies to take a look at everything. All right, Diana, thank you so much for all of the wonderful information. Um, I personally can't wait to go and look at the Ed Sheeran stuff because I'm a <laughs> huge fan. And um, I just want to see, you know, I've heard about it. Yeah. But I want to see how close they are. I've never researched it. Yeah. You are, <laughs> you are absolutely the queen of copyright. And we appreciate all the information you gave us today. Well, I love teaching. Like I said, I, I'm kind of a copyright geek. My little heart of copyright. I don't, I don't know why I love it so much. But once I finally started to understand it, I, <laughs> I love it. So, uh, thank you for having me. And, and definitely, like I said, I love Ed Sheeran. And when I listened to the video or you know to the songs, and once I saw the pattern, I was like, oh, I still love him. <laughs> but there are some issues. So he's he's <laughs> working on taking care of it, though. I think. 